guys are ridiculous. These guys are ridiculous. Now, how about them damn Celtics? And we are back with another episode of How About Them Celtics. Sam and I are here recording on Monday, April 1st. We are recording this ahead of the Celtics Hornets game, which you guys will hear about later on in the episode. And by later on, I mean in like 30 seconds. Uh, But before we get into that, a reminder, as always, if you're watching on YouTube, make sure to leave a like on the video. It really helps. Uh, And subscribe to the How About Them Celtics YouTube channel. It is free. If you're watching, or I I should say listening, I should say, on podcast platforms, leave a five-star review and follow the show there. We would appreciate it very much. And if you're on Apple, make sure to leave a review. Say hi to us there. We'd appreciate it very much. Um, Yeah. Without further ado, let's get into our recap of the Celtics Hornets game. All right, Sam and I are here after Celtics Hornets. Celtics picking up their second win in a row back on track after those rough games against the Hawks. They took down the uh, Pelicans this past weekend and now a 118-104 victory over the Hornets and Grant Williams, who actually had himself a good game. Uh, but Jason Tatum and Kristaps Porzingis leading the way. Sam Hauser with 25 points as well. Red hot from deep. Uh, good overall win for the Seas. Uh, shot well from the field. Pretty average from three, although they took 53 threes, which is insane to look at uh, in the box score. Um, meanwhile, the Hornets shot pretty well, were red hot to start the gates, but then the Celtics. Honestly, I, I think they played the same level of defense throughout the game. It's just the Hornets like stopped making ridiculous shots because they came out of the gates making everything for no reason. Um, and the Celtics, I thought, played actually pretty good defense and were contesting stuff. But Good win. This is exactly what you want a game against the Hornets on a Monday night on League Pass in April to be like this. Picture perfect. Good job. <laughs> yeah, good job. They won. Uh, overall, really good Tatum game. Tatum, I didn't even realize he had 10 rebounds, but it felt like he was doing even more than that. He was scoring it well. Everything was easy for him. He looked very comfortable out there. Every shot he took felt good. Nothing really felt forced. He did a good job of moving the ball. He only had four assists, but it felt like he was connecting guys like it was nobody's business. He had a great pass to Hauser at the end of the third quarter that I know you tweeted out, but did a great job of drawing a double and finding the hot hand and looked pretty. Um, did not realize Holiday was one of 11, so that's pretty good. Good for yeah, him. One. Yeah, but nobody noticed. <laughs> well, John Smyers on Twitter noticed, but John Smyers oh. notices whenever Holiday does something poor. He did notice. Uh, okay. I, I take All that right, with yeah, the great credit. Assault. Credit. Well, I, that that is that is like I'm trying to think of the comparison. That is like you noticing a Tatum step back miss. So I'm not I'm not going to give him too much credit because he hates Drew Holiday. So we're gonna we're gonna leave it there, which I don't understand. But regardless, um, yeah, rough shooting night for Holiday. But uh, Tatum did Tatum, uh, have one of the worst. Hey, look at me, ISO plays of all time. He tried to score on Poku and then ended up driving to two guys and getting stopped. I know he just got completely swallowed up. Um, that was a tough one, and then. Who was it, Poku or was it Bertans so who just nailed a three on the other end, too? One of them. Did. I think it was Poku, but I don't think it was like in his but, face or anything. Yeah. Uh, this was a really good Tatum game, though. I, I think he, he, like you said, did a good job of setting guys up. Four of 10 from deep. He did take a lot of threes, but you. Uh, you can just tell how much this fucking dude loves playing in Charlotte. Like he just loves playing at the spectrum center. There were a million Celtics fans in the building. Uh, he did a great job driving and there was one play. I can pull it up because I think I tweeted it. I know you just like the step backs. I understand. Um, but as me and Bobby, I forget if it was Bobby or if it was somebody else we were talking to says the reason takes Tatum needs to keep taking those step backs is because of plays like this. I'm going to pull it up uh, and you'll understand what I'm saying in a second. You, you won't. I promise that face you're making will change because it definitely it absolutely makes sense. Just you need to let me explain. So <clears throat> at this point, Tatum had making step backs the whole night. It step back, step back, step back on Brandon Miller. So Tatum gets the ball, dribbles it up the wing against Brandon Miller, dribble, dribble. Brandon Miller has to play up because of the step back. He has to play up, has to play up. So as soon as he's able to get a lane, Jason Tatum, free dunk right by him. Because of the pressure of the step back threes, because he had been making them, Brandon Miller had to play up, and Tatum uses his burst to get by him for an easy dunk. This is the balance you need. This is the balance. Hit him with the Isaiah. Exactly. Exactly. This is the balance. So credit to Tatum. I think he did a good job of finding that balance tonight um, while also acknowledging that, hey, I'm hot. I can take a couple extra tonight, and it's fine. I think he had a good uh, a good mix of everything, and like you said, his playmaking was also awesome. So good, good Tatum game. Good for him. To his credit, he's been doing a lot more of driving off those sick dribbles yeah. uh, late in the season. He, he is looking to be more aggressive, so that's like a positive, right? I, I don't like when it's a three every single time. I, I can understand there being a mix, but when you have like – an oil tanker garden, you just fucking go buy him, will you? <laughs> Fuck's sake. I don't need to see you take a step back into the crowd with fucking 
Brooke Lopez guarding you. Go around him, will you? Uh, Horford, back. Turn back the clock tonight. Yeah. He was making shots inside. He had a dunk. We saw the first ever Celtics high-low against a 2-3 zone. Whew. It was stuff to make you cry Whew. watching them play at the <laughs> Spectrum Center there. Great Horford game, man. Glad to see him Rock. making threes. He was the beneficiary of several great ball movement possessions. Mm-hmm. And I think that says a lot about him just being in the right spots, whether it was on the, the dunker spot catch and finish off of the Porzingis high-low or just being in the corner ready to fire it up there. He mm-hmm. has done a great job. So big credit to Al Horford. I liked seeing him be an offensive option a bit tonight because I feel like in the playoffs at some point you might need that. You might 100%. need him to go through somebody's chest. Definitely. And I, I think – he was good and also good. The other big man, this was another example of Kristaps is mm. a cheat code game. He just, yeah. he, you just lose the first, the first fucking play of the game. They had Grant on KP and he just goes psych rip through. See you later, buddy. Um, for what it's worth, the foul Grant had on KP late. I don't think was a foul. I don't think Grant I agree with you played straight up. Um, but there were two straight possessions in I forget if it was the third. I think it was the third quarter in my notes here. He had two straight possessions with Marquez Bolden on him. By the way, Jason Tatum's teammate, Marquez Bolden, shout mm-hmm. out from college, um, where he just posted him right below the free throw line, turn around, jump shot, foul, and one. Just two straight back to back. You can't do anything to stop it. Like that is the cheat code. And then for the rest of the game, because of Tatum's elite scoring earlier in the game and Porzingis doing that twice. Sam Hauser was just fucking butt naked open. The Hornets were like, all right, I guess if we have to, you know, leave somebody on the three point line, we'll leave Hauser. Stupid. <laughs> like, what you, what, how is that the game plan? What are you doing? There was another one late in the game where it was right after the foul that I don't think was a foul. Grant fouls Porzingis in the post. Vasil Micic tries to strip the ball from Porzingis in the post and just leaves Derek White in the corner. Like, what, what the fuck? What are you doing, Charlotte? There were some really, no really bad leaving guys open from the Hornets. I mean, Hauser came out and made like five out of six threes, and then yeah. he was somehow just wide open across the Every court time. from, I think, Tatum on one but possession. Maybe. Yep. And I was like, what is going on here? What are these guys doing? Hauser mm-hmm. was unbelievable today. He was moving well without the ball. He looks like the guy that went down with the ankle injury. He was red hot from three. I honestly was thinking about it, and I was like, maybe Sam Hauser should be out there at the end of the games. It's hard to be like, hey, this guy shouldn't be out there in exchange for him. But do you really think it's a bad idea to have somebody that's hot? (laughs) If he's hot. Yeah, like he's automatic, and he's good without the ball. Like, it almost feels like you could use some of the extra without the ball movement. Somebody that's used to not having it and is willing to cut and be a decoy maybe could could be beneficial for them in a, in a tight game situation. I thought they yeah. closed quarters well today too, which was really well. a nice sight to see. I would like them to maybe have end of quarter shots or, or possessions be practiced for late game where they're trying to beat the buzzer. Because I think it was the second quarter, Tatum had the ball, and it was a slow-paced possession. Obviously, you're trying to run the clock down. But it didn't end in a basket. I didn't think whatever they got was terrible. Maybe I'm tripping. Maybe they did get a basket. But it was a lot, a lot of dribble. A lot of dribble. Like, there was not movement. It mirrored a lot of what we see late in the game. And I think if they really want to have a sandbox to play in, they might as well use the end of the quarters for that. At least for a little bit here. Like, Wednesday could be a nice chance against OKC to – Sprinkle in some stuff you're looking to execute in a tight game. For sure. Um, I also say I think this was a big gravity game. Uh just having and that's equally you think the Hornets so? you are think bad. So yeah, with the Hornets this is equally guys. Equally the Hornets aren't good, but like even the plays where they didn't completely leave guys, like that Hauser play at the end of the quarter, they screen for Tatum. Miles Bridges just did nothing. Like it was his fault because he didn't rotate anywhere. But like you had him, Tatum driving to the wing. Guys helping over all eyes on Tatum and then just Hauser butt naked open on the other side of the court. Um, that's gravity. There was like obviously the Porzingis ones where they showed uh, multiple bodies at him in the paint. Gravity like that. That's another one. The foul on O'Shea Brissett or excuse me, the foul against O'Shea Brissett when he almost had the super cool lob. That was all gravity because everyone was staring at Porzingis. Easy. Like all of this comes down to like the Hauser offensive rebound when he got in there and, and snuck in and had the putback gravity people are paying attention to the wrong people it, it all comes back to 
Tame and Porzingis are such great scorers that the Hornets are sending multiple bodies, or at the very least, that's all players are paying attention to. And some of that will go away because the Hornets are a terrible defense. This was horrendous. Steve Clifford should have head in hands. Like, what are we doing? Like, he, he got a tech early on for a reason, but <clears throat> it, it shows credit to the Celtics for finding that and taking advantage. Also, for what it's worth, this is the first time in three games the Celtics cracked the 40 point three or 43s attempted mark, um, which I think. Shattered. I'm not saying even just I'm not saying I know <laughs> they shot a bunch. I'm not saying like chuck them up, but I, I do think like it is a, a marker of good offense for them. It is a marker that they are passing and driving and kicking effectively. Um as long as they're coming in the right way. And I think they did, especially tonight against the Hornets. So credit to them. Derek White also good. Um for a great Very game good. for him, 19, 9, and 5 in a block, sick block on, on Vasa Micic. 7 of 15, 4 10. He rocked three point stroke is back i don't know if it ever left but it felt like there were a couple games there yeah it felt like there were a couple games there where he was a little cold but he did a great job controlling the pace you saw a little bit more of that Derek white christophs rosingas uh two-man game a little bit as well which we posted a video on go look if you'd like um so that was fun and for what it's worth he didn't have much box score impact but i thought O'Shea Brissett was pretty good in this game like he was cutting Mm. at the right times he had that really good contest uh on the hornets fast break and then that led to a crazy sam hauser three in the quarter that motherfucker was moving fading away in the corner just yeah well, up there um but yeah i thought o'shea was bounds. good off the bench i thought he played good minutes i like o'shea minutes man i i stand by that he has the energy that could spin a playoff game on its head i don't think we'll actually have to see it but if he could make threes man he would be a great nba like role player he really would uh charlotte miles bridges not very good at finishing layups very, very bad at finishing layups. That man, what was he? Ten? He was 10 of 23. He must have missed at least five layups, left 10 points right at the rim. Shout out to Grant, though, because Grant did really like battle in this game. He played hard through the end. He played good defense good. through the end. He was efficient for 23 points, two of four from three. Good for Grant. Good to see him playing well in, in Charlotte, even though we like to joke on Grant. like Seems like a pretty decent guy for what it's worth. Uh, he played well, like yeah. Him. Except for Michael. Tatum. Yeah, except for Mike Gordon. You, you hear Drew Carter reference it on the broadcast. Yeah, it was like kind of weird. Was like, I, uh, Scout like didn't say anything. Yeah. It felt awkward. No, but Grant had a good game. I thought he played pretty good defense, as good as you can against Kristaps Porzingis as six foot six. Um, I thought he got called for that that bogus foul, but other than that, he, he was fighting. He tried his best. Like that's all you can really ask for him. This Hornet center rotation is cooked when Marquise Bolden is your go-to, like only guy over six ten in your rotation. That's at a poku who Dude, Poku stinks. <laughs> yeah, I know we got Tatum on that one drive, but this guy is. The, there was this one play. It was the first clip I tweeted of the night. Um, <clears throat> Celtics were running in transition, and this man Poku. Usually, the term "head on a swivel" is like a good thing. <laughs> he was fucking lost <laughs> on this play. Watch, watch Poku uh, try to find like who his matchup is, where he's supposed to be on this play. This is first quarter action. Um, Celtics bring the ball down the floor changing the screen right now um here we go Celtics bringing the ball down the floor luke cornett kicks it pritchard's driving look at poku he's like well, hmm, where am i going where's my guy uh i think i have cornett so i'll just kind of stand in the oh boy here. let me hang out here yeah he oh where's the, really the guy in the corner where's the guy in the corner where's the guy in the corner wait 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 net barely <laughs> moves Wait, let's look at this. Let's watch the moment of panic when he realizes the guy in the corner okay he goes okay he's in the corner here he's in the corner here Wait, what the fuck? Where's the guy? He looks the wrong way. <laughs> Who are you going to see over there? Are you looking for the photographer? He thought he was in the corner, man. He thought he was in the corner. He wasn't even looking at the corner. You can't see the corner. You're looking out of bounds. <laughs> so bad. So bad. Uh, are there any other cool clips? I feel like there were a bunch of like fun things that happened to this game. One um, thing I want to talk about well, while you yeah. look. This was a great game because it felt like multiple guys had their fingerprints all over it at different stretches. Because there was a Tatum stretch, there was a Porzingis stretch, and then there was a really fun Hauser stretch. And there was even some Derek White stretches mixed in there where he was just making the most open corner threes you're ever going to see. I like that they were able to play through multiple guys for multiple stretches, and they were able to feast doing it. Tatum feasted. Porzingis had his way with the centers that the Hornets don't have. Sam Hauser was having the offense run through him and he was just running around and it was all efficient. It worked. Charlotte didn't have an answer. You could do this in the playoffs. You can, you can run the offense through Sam Hauser if you have to. It's crazy. What it takes. <laughs> it's crazy. Monday night, Charlotte game on April <laughs> fool's day. I'll tell you that. Football season may be over, but the action on the floor is heating up. Whether it's a tournament season 
or the fight for a playoff home court, there's no shortage of high stakes basketball moments this time of year. Get in on the excitement with Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app, where you can turn your hoops knowledge into serious cash. Testing my skills on Prize Picks this season is the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. If you have the skills, you can turn $10 into $1,000 with just a few taps. Prize Picks is really simple to play, and I can make my picks and submit my entry in less than 60 seconds. Download the app today and use code CLNS for a first deposit match up to $100. Use the code CLNS for the first deposit match up to $100. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Yeah, psych. It is crazy to say out loud, but I totally understand and agree with what you were saying. Like the Celtics have so many weapons. I did find a couple clips um, that I want to see this one play from KP getting the ball. I think the Celtics have run this for Tatum in the past, and I vividly remember. I forget what game it was. It might have been the Sixers game earlier in the season where Horford got a couple threes in the corner in crunch time and Tatum found him. Um, this similar to this play at the very least. I don't know if it's one to one, but Derek White gets the ball at the top of the key. <clears throat> then passes it to Chris stops. Um, it, it's horns. They're, they're running horns uh, effectively, uh, except Tatum didn't get to the other elbow yet. Um, but Chris stops, gets the ball at the wing. Tatum sets a screen for Derek white who drives, but since the Hornets aren't switching and they don't want to put Trey man on Tatum, Trey man is forced to go all the way around this Tatum screen, which allows Chris stops for to find him in the lane. Miles bridges has to help over. And then Al over gets the most open three you've ever seen in your life. And it's cash. Like, it's free offense. If the Hornets aren't switching, then you're cooked. Like it, it, the Hornets have to switch this. This is terrible defense by the Hornets. If you don't switch this, you lose. And spoiler alert, they, they fucking lost. This is terrible defense. Um, so credit to Celtics for seeing it. And that's always going to be open for them. I love horns. <clears throat> I love horns. You'd love to see it. Um, other thing, I uh, need audio for this. And apologies if the audio is bad because mm. I took it on my computer. Just... This play late in the game, Celtics taking a bunch of threes, missing a bunch of threes, but the fucking crowd in Charlotte was all Celtics. Just just listen to this. And I'll turn it up in post. So, Sam, we might not be, be able to hear it, but they'll be able to hear it. Mm. Push. Hauser waits, shoots. Holiday tries it. Look for another offensive rebound. Richard says, why not? Oh, my goodness. The marathon possession. <laughs> Celtics fans on their feet here in Charlotte. Wipe the tip. <laughs> the- <laughs> Just the crowd going nuts for the Celtics and Charlotte. Like, I, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I think Charlotte is the most Celtics infested away fan city in the NBA. It's up there. Denver to me. <laughs> Denver I feel to- like every time I- they go to Denver, it's a huge Celtics presence. And Denver's actually good. Like, I think that, like, one and a half multiplier. I think that multiplies that. it. But I think the fact that Charlotte sells so few tickets normally <laughs> makes it seem even greater because the only motherfuckers buying tickets to these games are Celtics fans. Like, at least Nuggets have some guys or, or people there who are there to see the Celtics. Uh, or excuse me, the Nuggets. But as they should. <laughs> yeah, respect. Um, I don't know what else there's to say about this game. It's good. Peyton Pritchard looks solid. He couldn't make his threes, but he was making plays. He had five assists. Kristaps Porzingis was a great connector in this game, too. He was making some nice passes. He had five assists. Um, I feel like it's egregious to say, is that his season high? But what is Porzingis' season high in assists? It feels like he doesn't always finish with a lot of assists this year. I don't know how many like, assists. <clears throat> five is a big number for him, I feel like. Yeah, it's a, yeah. his career his season high is seven, but five is second. So, yeah. Look, at, look at me. Yeah. I know Paul. Um, yeah. Any, any final thoughts? Uh, Grant was good. I'm try- I like looked over to the Hornets to see if there's anything I want to talk about with the Hornets. Brandon Miller looks all right. He he had that super cool um fucking deke of Derek White. He's like, psych, I'm gonna tap the ball to myself. See you later. Yeah, I was thinking about that. I was like, huh, is that something like I should start trying? <laughs> it's like it looked kind of like, cool. That, I was like, yeah, like okay. I it's kind of like logistical. Like if you yeah. if you're gonna tap the ball and you already know that you're gonna be moving, it is an advantage. Yeah, and he faked him out. And Derek White's no slouch. Derek White's an all defensive player. Like he got his ass too. Um, but yeah, good good for the Celtics. I think Tatum was the best player in this game. Porzingis was amazing as well. Porzingis only took ten shots, Sam. Yeah, <laughs> I don't crazy. like that he had the sixth most shots on this team with Jalen Brown. I, out. Like he should probably have the second most. I think that's also kind of fake. 
because he did have eight free throws. So technically yeah. he took like 14 shots um, and or I guess somewhere and ones. But I, I don't know. It did feel like the ball was moving well. Derek White played within the flow of the offense and Sam Hauser was red hot. So the guys ahead of him and I guess Horford and Drew took like one more. But I feel like Porzingis had the second most touch. Maybe you shouldn't have. <laughs> I, I feel like Porzingis game. had the second most touches on the team, which is more important. Like he, he had the ball every time he was in and for what it's worth. It felt like they took him out a lot, too. Like, there was a long stretch for, like, the second quarter where he just didn't play. And I was like, is he just done? Like, are they going to put him back in the game? Like, what the hell? Yeah, no, I mean, I don't need to see Porzingis play the whole game, to be honest I'm with you. Not complaining. At this point. <laughs> that was far from a complaint. Um, but he sat the first eight minutes-ish of the second quarter. Maybe I'm crazy, but it just felt like he didn't play a lot. But good. Good win for the Celtics. Any final thoughts before we send it over? No. All right. Enjoy the rest of the pod, everybody. All righty, we are back after Celtics Hornets, and we are here to right our wrongs. Our comments got very mad at us after the Pelicans recap uh, about us not talking about the defense that Jalen Brown played on Zion Williamson. And you were right, our bad. We were in a playback for two hours, and we talked about it with Jake there, and then we just forgot to talk about it on our show. But Jalen Brown did do a great job <laughs> defending Zion Williamson. We talked about it on Talk and Seas earlier today. But uh, good call. Good call comments. Our bad. Hand up. No problem with the comments calling us out, especially if they're trying to spread positivity, which is good on them. We usually don't get that. We usually get uh, Luke Cornette is terrible. Why do you guys talk about him? Uh, you know, player B sucks too. Why Why do people care about him? But no, you actually, usually Jalen is at the uh, crosshairs of some of the criticism quite a bit. So shout out to you guys for praising him because he did play well. Uh, it was one of the big stories from the second half on Sunday. Jalen did a great job defending Zion. We have it on the sheet one of six against Jalen. Anytime they are technically matched up, Jalen got the better of them. And like you mentioned, we talked about it on Talking Seas today, and I don't know if you're pulling up the clips, but if you pull them up, we'll see how great he does at bringing Zion to the help, which is part of playing defense in the NBA. It's not like he is a help merchant. He was making intelligent decisions when guarding the basketball, driving left, I mean, driving him to his right as a lefty, Swaying him towards the help defense. Horford, Tillman, Porzingis all did a number on the big fella there. Mm. Yeah, no, Jalen did a good job of uh, fronting him. He, he talked about the challenge. Um, he said, different strategy than usual, but whatever the team needs. I feel like that's something my team relies on me to do now. So I'll take it with honor and responsibility. This was my matchup, and I wanted to make sure we made it tough on him, and I think we did. Uh, he said, quote, you got to be strong enough to take the initial bump, but you also got to be quick enough to stay in front of him, which makes him a tough matchup. You don't see a lot of guys like Zion in the world. Uh, for what it's worth, uh, matchup data on uh, NBA.com said, Zion shot one of six against Jalen Brown, although... NBA matchup data also lies. Um, this not to diminish Jalen Brown's success, but it truly was a team effort guarding um, <clears throat> Zion Williamson throughout the game. I have the clips here. You look at the quote six shots that um, Zion took against Jalen, and a, a picture forms really quickly that the Celtics just defended him as a team, right? Like Jalen's job <clears throat> was to be the initial defender on him. This was the one make he had uh, on the night, and it was a very tough finish um, <clears throat> against Jalen Brown and a team of Porzingis as well, but. Past that, it is all Jalen Brown being the initial defender on Zion Williamson, <clears throat> making it tough for him at the start, and then feeding him into a flurry of other Celtics help defenders, including Kristaps Porzingis, who blocks him there, and then once again blocks him a second time with their quite playing help defense in the paint. Uh, and <clears throat> as Sam mentioned, Al Horford and Xavier Tillman doing a great job on him as well. You're going to see the same clip twice here if you're watching on YouTube, but Jalen deserves all the credit. Our bad comments. We did forget to talk about it. I wrote about it for what it's worth. I did write about it for Celtics blog, uh, telling, uh, you know, discussing how good of a job he did, his comments on the matter, uh, and his focus on defense, which has been a priority for him this season. But um, again, as you see from the clips, it was truly a team effort. Zion Williamson is a tough cover. Jalen Brown drives him into a team of Tillman and Horford uh, there. And so credit to the Celtics as a team for slowing him down after a red hot first quarter in which he shot five Oh six. So good for Jalen. Yeah, they let him get to his left every single time in the first, just go in reverse every single time. Easy layup for Zion. Good to see them adjust. Mm -hmm. W um, that's literally the only Celtics thing there was to talk about because it's March and there's nothing. So we're going to go right to the email here. <laughs> Let's go do the email. See what y'all have to say. Reminder to comment. What's popping on the podcast for a chance to win a $10 in pop needle gift card. Uh, we do have two entries today, so we will be spinning the wheel. Uh, we have Spin. Mr. Sean Seiler. 
that uh wheel you can't pause when you say spin the wheel too because then i really get lost <laughs> oh no you can, come on it's for dramatic effect sean siler it's dead air <laughs> <laughs> sean siler and zach nugent uh, are getting the spin on the wheel today uh sean, said you're curious in the comments. sean we appreciate you you should be nice to people as well. we, can, we can do both at the same time zach the incognito Zach, email us at hbtcpod at gmail.com with your name and phone number. We'll get you hooked up with a $10 incognito gift card. Again, comment what's popping on the podcast on YouTube or in the email um, for a chance to win a $10 incognito gift card. <clears throat> Thank you all for entering. Zach, send us an email. Uh, all right, let's go to that email now. We have three from RJ. RJ, the email goat. Let's see. <clears throat> what's popping? Nap time instead of NOLA. Mm. evening gents sorry i missed most of your playback session i was grabbed a nap thinking it was a 5 p.m start here in san francisco watching the replay i liked how the seas regrouped early but uh after the early burst from the pelicans nothing new or different just stepping up their defense a notch i'm feeling much calmer tonight after the uh, then after the hawks game maybe it was the nap while we aren't seeing a lot of innovative plays in the final 10 games tonight looked like a preview of coach missoula's playoff rotation Nine deep with the starting six pulling between 30 to 35 minutes apiece. Pritchard and Hauser were their usual selves off the bench, and Tillman was the center du jour based on matchup. I'm confident Luke will get minutes when he pairs up better. Magic numbers for HCA in the finals is down to three. Another good thing. Be well, RJ, and I think even the C's towel. Uh, what is this? And I think even the C's towel, towel, boy. By towel boy had a good game tonight. W, W game from the C's. Yeah, tough one to take a nap through. Best game of the week. You had the abysmal performances against Atlanta. Then you actually get like a game where they had to respond to a little bit of adversity. They went down double digits against the Pelicans. It doesn't happen. And then they came back and won. Mm -hmm. Pretty good game. Sorry you missed us, RJ. We missed you. (laughs) Next one from RJ again. What's popping one game at a time? Evening, guys. Well, it was a good weekend for me. Obviously, the Celtics winning along with the Nuggets and Timberwolves losing means the Celtics can clinch home court advantage through the finals if they win Monday in Charlotte. And then excuse me, take down the Thunder in Boston on Wednesday, but one game at a time. Let's see the green take bear, take care of business in the Tar Heel state first. The main Celtics had a great closeout uh, on Saturday with Jordan Walsh coming, uh, canning the winning free throw with 0.4 seconds left in the game to give the Lobster Lads a first round bye in the G League playoffs, putting up a 27 and 10 double double and going five of 12 from the land of plenty is nothing to sneeze at either. <clears throat> Finally, and a non-Boston front. My alma mater, Purdue, got back to the Final Four for the first time in 44 years. The last time they did it, I was a senior in high school. Larry Bird was in his rookie season, and Joe Barry Carroll was the presumptive number one pick. Zach Eady is averaging 30 points and 16.3 rebounds in the tourney, improving on his 24, 11, and 7 season numbers. Uh, two games to get the brass ring, but first they've got a date with NC State on Saturday. Here's hoping a week ahead plays out well on all fronts. Be well, RJ. Big wins for Purdue lately. Good for you. It was close for a lot of the game. Tennessee had nothing. I'll tell you what, they had that one guy and then nobody else did anything. Brutal yeah. if you're a Tennessee fan. <laughs> um, Nick, nasty. He is nasty. How how high is he supposed to get drafted? I heard lottery. I think he's broaching on top 10. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Edie. Everyone keeps saying Celtics. Everybody, I keep seeing it on Twitter. Saw mm-hmm. it today. Edie to the Celtics. If they get him, I hope um, he actually has time to develop. Because I don't know how ready he's going to be for the switchability, but I know you've compared him to Cornette. And if he's going to do that and be yeah. okay at it, then fine. Yeah, I don't hate that idea. He can just be a better Cornette, or a taller Cornette, which is crazy because Cornette's huge. Um, <clears throat> so, good for Edie. Uh, did you see, speaking of runs in the playoffs, mentioning the Purdue's run, did you see the run UConn went on against Illinois? Yeah, 30 to nothing. <sighs> That's insane. That that's enough. To, like, I mean, use your context, Sam. What if that happening against the Celtics? Well, that's like one of those things. If it happened against the Celtics, I'd be mad at the Celtics. Like, it's not oh, yeah. like one of those. Uh, you know, the Luca scoop shot from the three point line underhand that, that was went insane. In. That mm-hmm. would make me break my TV. But if it's just thirty unanswered points, that's more than one fluky thing happening. That's either the other team is straight up better than you, or your entire team is melted. <clears throat> That is crazy. The 30 all run is insane. I wonder when the last time that happened is that's that's disastrous. It's anyway. tough. It's tough to contextualize that because there's probably a ton of 30 0 runs in college basketball because they schedule those Mickey Mouse games early in the season. So they get off it's to true. a good resume for their tournament bid. Mm-hmm. It's true. I don't know. We were good for UConn, though. They're in the final four. NC State, though, the run, the run of centuries. Um, <clears throat> all right. Last email from RJ. 
What's poppin'? Why wait? Morning, guys. Fun talking to you today, Monday. Uh, as regards to Drew's quote about getting figuratively, figuratively, quote, punched in the mouth, my uh, reply is, why wait? I'd love to see the Celtics come out in the game and assert their superiority from the start. I think the last time we saw something like that was the Jazz game in Boston where the Seas came out strong and just kept dominating. That's all. Be well, RJ. Um, yeah, game. I mean, I, <clears throat> ideally, yeah, they did it in the Warriors game. Uh, that's always Portland. the ideal, but I think Drew's point is like, it's March. It, it was good to get punched in the mouth to our mind. Like, okay, we can't sleepwalk through all these games. Um, and so hopefully they won't need to get punched in the mouth in the playoffs is my, I, I think is, is the takeaway. Yeah. I mean, I understand RJ's take here. You don't want to have to come out and respond, but it's nice to see them actually respond when it's put in front of them. Because mm -hmm. one of the things we all complain about when it comes to the clutch games is like every time they're in a clutch game, it goes to shit. Well, Every time they come out and get punched in the mouth, it doesn't go to shit. They they actually know how to figure that out. So that should make you feel good because this is a situation in the playoffs that could happen. You could be going on the road to play game three against, let's say, Atlanta, where you just lost two in a row, and they come out with some juice. The home crowd's pumped, especially now that they saw you lose twice. <clears throat> and the, the team feeds off it. And you go down five, ten points early. How do you respond? Well, if you do what you did on Saturday, you're going to be just fine. You're going to lock in on defense. And you're going to completely drain the energy out of the building. That's what you want in a playoff game. It's going to happen. The playoffs, as much as I wish they were perfect, will not be perfect. I, I highly doubt that they will be perfect. I'm sure even if they win all the games, they're going to make mistakes along the way. They're going to put themselves in tough spots. It's what we've seen this group do for years now. Every time they go to the postseason, it's like, oh, yeah, okay, we'll lose the first two games to Miami. We'll lose game one against Philly. We'll fail to sweep the Hawks in the first round. You name it, losing like all the home games to Milwaukee in the second round two years ago, failing to win home games against the Heat two years ago. Like, just the inconsistency we've seen from the Celtics in the playoffs in recent years should make you want to see them be able to respond when things don't go well. That's why I think everybody gets so upset about the late game stuff because if if you're watching them melt there, what's going to happen in the playoffs? Mm. And you could say they might not get there, but the playoffs <laughs> shit happens. They might get there. Mm. Yeah, I'm not I, looking I think... at re-argue with you just just before you start i'm sorry okay it's not what i'm trying to do i was like i was i was listening to you talking like how the hell did we get here how, how did this happen <laughs> yeah no no i i'm not looking to make you upset i just that's just where my brain took me i was like how, how is this the pathway of, of thought process but thank you rj for the email we appreciate it before we jump to the nba section uh just a reminder that we are recording on april fool's day and taylor snow decided to share this beauty uh, and it just everything I see on Twitter today just throws me for a loop and I get really confused. Um, Damn, dude, they those... did Derek White dirty. I know, right? Listen, they should audio put like platform. the beard on his head. <laughs> if you're listening on audio platforms, it's just a picture of the entire Celtic starting five. But if they were bald, for what it's worth, I think they kind of look uh, Porzingis and Jalen look sick. I think they they could they could rock it. I don't know about Tatum and Drew as much, but Drew still uh, has his back braids. That's fucked. I know. I He's know. Got the Costanza going on with his braids. Jalen does too. It's just less noticeable. You can see a little uh, more. Uh, anyways, jumping over to the NBA section now, we can take a look at the standings, see who's doing what, see who's playing well, see who's playing like shit. Uh, let me pull it up on the screen for y'all. <clears throat> Spoiler alert, as per usual, Celtics still 11 game lead in the Eastern Conference. They're cooking. They, they haven't let up a yes. bit. Uh, the Bucks just picked up a win. They're 6 and 4 in the last 10. The Cavs, 4 and 6 in the last 10. Uh, and the rest of the Eastern Conference top six is playing pretty well. Knicks seven and three, <clears throat> Magic six and four, Pacers six and four. That race is tight. Knicks only a game ahead of the Magic. Pacers only a game and a half behind the Magic. Um, the Heat have fallen into or are still in the play-in tournament, but are only half a game uh, out of the Pacers. Pacers who could fall into that play-in. Uh, meanwhile, the Sixers who have a guy coming back who we'll talk about very soon, um, sitting in the play-in as well. Uh, two games out of the six seed. Th this race for five through eight is a lot closer than I thought it would be uh, heading into the final couple of days. I really thought the Heat and Sixers would stay down there. And as per usual, the Bulls, Hawks, 9 10, the rest of these doesn't matter. You know, well, Toronto's now lost 13 straight. But you know what's funny Yikes. is um, kind of rooting for the Pacers to fall back. <clears throat> yeah. Just like if you want to think of like, I just don't want to stress early in the playoffs. And I know all season I've been like, ah, like, I don't love the idea of playing the Pacers. They did beat the Celtics a couple times in the regular season. But like, 
if if Miami leapfrogs them, that means you don't have to play Miami no matter what in the first round. But actually, you wouldn't have to play them again until the conference finals. Then you would have Philly versus Indiana, 7-8. Mm-hmm. It's tough to imagine Philly losing to them with a healthy Embiid. Like in, in a game that they're like trying to win. Mm-hmm. Then you, you get the pick of Indiana, Chicago, Atlanta. That's really what your top seed in the Eastern Conference should earn yeah. you. I would Instead, you're it. over here sweating. Am I going to have to fucking deal with Embiid? Am I going to have to play Jimmy well, Butler again? What the hell's the point of playing well all season to get the one seed when you got to deal with this? I guess. Would you rather play Cleveland, New York, or Orlando in the first round than Miami or Philly? Uh, maybe Cleveland <laughs> the way they're playing right now. I'll tell you that. Ass. I know. I think go- Tom Mitchell. I think all three of those teams are significantly better than the others, though. Even though the Heat obviously have the the trauma that comes with it uh, in Boston, but uh, you think you always say Philly doesn't I don't know. matter. <clears throat> you think what? You you don't think like a healthy Embiid makes Philly better than some of those other teams? I'm not saying they're beat the Celtics good, but I, I mean they're probably better I, than Orlando. We're gonna talk about this, but I also just don't think you're gonna get a fully healthy Embiid. <laughs> I just don't believe that at all. <laughs> I can't Not wait until he comes back just so we know. Whether, whether like you're right or like he is looking good, I just would like to know. We'll see. Like I don't idea. think we're going to – we're not going to know till the play-in, though, because you, you really think they're going to drop him in at 30 minutes a night against these guys in the regular season? Um, I think they might do a little bit of a tune-up, yeah. I I think they'll like cap him out at like a 20-minute restriction before the playoffs at, at most. Um. Anyways, Western Conference, the race for the top seed is – uh. A good one. OKC and Denver have now clinched the playoffs. Uh, they're the second and third teams to clinch the playoffs since the Celtics 17 days ago. Uh, Nuggets are half a game behind the Thunder, who are the one seed out west. The Timberwolves also 7-3 and three in their last 10. Only one game back of the Thunder. They've been playing well without Cat. <clears throat> Clippers are falling, but the Pelicans' loss to the Celtics has dropped them back a little bit into six. Dallas is surging. They've won seven in a row, nine and one in their last 10. They are only two games out of the four seed and home court advantage in the playoffs. We didn't see that coming. Kings uh, and Suns are two games behind the Mavs and the Pelicans. A gap is forming there. Lakers only a game and a half out of the Kings and the Suns. And the Warriors have reestablished a little bit uh, because the Rockets lost and they are two games ahead of the Rockets now. And as per usual, Jazz Grizzlies, Blazers, Spurs, doesn't matter. <laughs> they, they're out. They're done. <clears throat> But yeah, oh, man, I, I just want the playoffs to start. Like, I'm looking at this and I'm just like thinking about matchups in my head. I'm like, oh, it'd be kind of fun if like the Pelicans played Minnesota. That means you get a small market team to advance no matter what. Mm-hmm. Like, I like the idea of OKC, obviously, maybe landing a Durant first round matchup. I know he was mercifully, mercifully, whatever the fuck the word is, mercifully booed. Is that how what you, are you say trying it? to say? They boot him nonstop. Mercy. Sorry, I just got to call my head. Shut up. You're going to have to say it again. And now YouTube has started playing. I'm going to lose my mind. <laughs> what did you just try to say? <laughs> this is unbelievably fucking cruel. I'm sorry. I couldn't hear you. I got to call. I'm not my saying the word out. again. You'll hear it on the edit. All right. Sounds good. They boot him nonstop right. every time he touched the ball. Respect. <laughs> okay. Gotcha. <laughs> but that would be great for the playoffs. I think that's like the kind of energy you want in a playoff series. If you're the NBA, Mercilessly. you like the... Got it. What is it? Mercilessly. 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 Okay. There we go. <laughs> that is not what I said. <laughs> not what I said at all. Uh, are the Kings going to fall out of the playoffs? You think they're going to lose two straight playing games? If the NBA uh, has anything to say about it, they will. I'll tell you that. I don't think they do. I think they'll beat the Lakers and the Warriors at the very least. And I think they could beat the Suns. I think the Kings are fine. You think Adam think- Silver's letting that happen? Yeah, I, shut the fuck up. I think they'll beat uh, one of those two teams. Frosty Bias on Twitter, if you're listening, I see you. I see you calling out all the free throws the Lakers are getting. I, I see it. I see the push from the NBA. They are unbelievably blessed by the free throw gods, a.k.a. Adam Silver. Anything can happen in the play but... I don't know. I think the Suns could just as easily fall out of there as the Kings could. They could. They could. Uh, Phoenix is a weird team because they just have no depth. Yeah. And, and they don't do math. So as talented I as would they love... are, they just don't set themselves up to succeed. It's, it's fucking weird. I would love a Clippers Mavericks first round. That'd be sick. Those they get a little bit of history. Like four years. Yeah. And then what we get like 
Suns or Kings, Nuggets, and then Thunder versus one of the other teams. Western Conference is a behemoth, man. <clears throat> this is crazy. Imagine the Rockets make it all the way out and play the Thunder. Rockets Thunder first round. <laughs> well, they finally <laughs> lost. They lost to Dallas. They got killed. So they're making it a little bit more difficult. They only have eight games left, and they got to yeah. make two games up on the Warriors. They do play the Warriors. They do play them. It's tough, though. It's tough. Who do they play in the rest of their games? Let me take a look. I don't know Rockets. their entire schedule, but. That game against Golden State should be on national TV if it's not. They've got, oh, God, Minnesota, Golden State, Miami, Dallas, Orlando. Yeah, okay, never mind. Sorry, Rockets. <laughs> Good fucking luck. Rockets uh, and might then, have yeah. had the clock straight midnight. <laughs> Utah, Portland, Golden, uh, Utah, Portland, Clippers. And what about the Warriors? Who do they got? Warriors to end their season have uh, Dallas, Houston, Dallas, Utah, uh, Lakers, Portland, New Orleans, Utah. So I guess it's not walk in the park either, but – We'll see what happens. Western Conference is fun, at the very least. Uh, anyways, first piece of NBA news. We mentioned it. Joel Embiid is supposed to return very soon, as soon as this Thursday, as you guys are listening to this. Uh, Adrian Wojnarowski of ESPN reporting it, stating that he should be back. Um, said the return of Philadelphia 76 er star Joel Embiid is imminent and could come as soon as, oh, excuse me, Tuesday uh, against the Thunder. Um, I don't buy it. I think this is a terrible idea. I said this on Talking Seas. I think they should shut him down for the season, except that this isn't their year. They're going to have a very, very tough road through the playoffs anyways, plus the fact that he's coming off an injury. For what it's worth, <clears throat> Google search, meniscus repair recovery time is typically six to nine months. Uh, and then I saw that recovery and re rehabilitation at the very least takes a few weeks. And it's been what, like two months, Le like two months since he's had the surgery. He did have surgery, by the way. I did look that up. He did have surgery. Like, I just I can't imagine this this going very well. Like, what's the upside? You make a miracle run to the title that you've never even come close to yet on an injured Embiid and a roster that you had to put together midway through the season with the intent of planning on like adding more this summer, like not even being this year, and the downside being Embiid re-injures the same knee. Like that doesn't like checks and balances the ups and downs. Like that doesn't feel like a good good choice they're making here. I don't know, man. Like, I I completely understand your take, and it's completely reasonable. Like, to to believe he's gonna come back and be a hundred percent would not be fair to him. We saw Rob come off a meniscus injury two years ago. Granted, he got hurt like now and then came back in the first round, so the turnaround on that was a little bit quicker than this. But at the same time, like when Embiid played this year, Philly was twenty six and eight. That's good for. 76.4% of their games they won. So if they if they had kept that pace all year, they would be better than everybody except the Celtics. The entire NBA, nobody has a winning percentage like that. Now, it's a small sample size. It's not necessarily sustainable. But this comes into a perspective of them that's like, hey, maybe we think we can compete this year. Maxie's playing better than he ever has. Granted, that should have happened with Harden leaving. He's going to have more opportunities and have more time to shine. They trade for Buddy Hill at the deadline. They add shooting. I think if you're the 76ers, solely from that point of view, you have reason to believe him coming back is worth it for you. Now, there is a risk to him coming back. One, he might suck. Two, he might get hurt worse. And if he gets hurt worse, what does that do for your team down the line? If that guy is hurt and he isn't able to be near the cal caliber he's been over the last couple of seasons, that's going to be tough to win games if you're Philly. It really is. You're not going to be able to compete. You're, you couldn't even get past the second round with him healthy. So I understand your perspective. I don't know if it's going to work perfect. But if you're Philly, you feel like this is as good of a team you've probably had, except for that 2019 team. You might as well try. Yeah. A um, couple things. The 26 and 8 record, like, yes, that's good. Of those, what is that? 34 games, 10 were against teams above 500. They beat the Celtics. Call me impressed. Yeah. Like, I, yeah, I get it. But, like, that's a tiny sample size. And of the 34 games he played, 24 were against below 500 teams. You're supposed to beat those teams, obviously. Um, but, like, I don't know. Um, I just, I don't buy it. I don't, this is a guy who's had uh, injury problems in the past. He's been injury prone. He's dealt with lower body issues throughout his entire career. He's 
even when he's been quote unquote fully healthy, he's dealt with problems in, in the playoffs of not being in shape, not being in all this, you know, not, not being good in the fourth quarter, not being up to it. Um, injury problems, potential issues, potential, you know, concerns. And now he's coming off a of surgery to fix a meniscus tear or partial tear or whatever in his leg. Like I just have a very hard time believing that he's, he, he could be good. He could be great. He could be fine, but expecting him to be the MVP front runner that he was carrying by all means, carrying this team. I know Max, has been good, but without him being, obviously you see what fucking happens, like Correct. carrying this team, expecting him to be that after menis- meniscus surgery, I think is stupid. I just, it's not going to happen. I just have no belief in, in it happening. And again, it's not like this is like Steph Curry and you've seen him do it before. If he hasn't made it past, past the second round. You're going to risk it. Like, really? Uh, I don't buy it. I, I don't buy it at all. I don't know. I, just, I can't get there, but. We can move on. Um, next thing we've got. It. Why? I would just get ready for next year. Why risk it? Well, I just told you why. They, they probably feel like they have a good chance. Like they played well when he was healthy. I guess. I, I just, I, I don't think the risk outweighs the reward in my opinion, I guess. And we can just differ. There. That's fine. It's, just, it's tough. It's tough. Cause he, if he gets re-injured, like, <laughs> this is gonna be one of the worst decisions you've ever made. Like that's yeah, horrendous. I mean, we laid it out. Like I, I get like what you're saying. I don't think it's outrageous, but I think there is a possibility he comes back and he's okay, at least serviceable. My big thing is if the difference between no Embiid is a they they wouldn't even be in the play-in. Like the Sixers team without Embiid is, is nothing. Versus MVP Embiid is oh they have a really good chance. They've been really good. Even if you're in between that with like a half healthy Embiid, like a quote unquote serviceable Embiid, like. What what's that peak look like? A six seed, right? Like that that's my whole thing. At that point, I would just rather get him fully healthy, ready for next season. And maybe they think he is fully healthy. I just I have a hard time believing that with his history and meniscus surgery. Like that just that it's hard for me to get him around. So You're justified in your your skepticism, but they also do know more than we do right now, at least. Sure. <laughs> Definitely. I don't know. <laughs> I I'm at least excited to see what happens with this in the next week. It, it is interesting. I just don't know. I don't know. I feel like they have to have some sort of confidence if they're going to bring him back. I I hope they do. Actually, well, maybe not from the Celtics' perspective, but for his for his health and safety, I hope they know what they're doing. Uh, and I, I don't doubt it. But anyways, next thing we got, Paul George uh, and the Clippers are supposedly not close on the extension. So all this stuff of, mm-hmm. oh, could Paul George go somewhere else this summer might have some backing to it. This is from Brian Windhorst of the Hoop Collective. Now, they can't sign Harden to extension during the season. That's not permitted by his style of contract, so that's not a surprise. Nothing happened there. But it's now been three months, give or take, and there's been no agreement on Paul George. And the word in the NBA is that they're apart. It's not like, let's have a big problem. They're they're apart. I think the league believes Paul George wants to remain a Clipper, and there would be concern in the league about recruiting Paul George, especially if you have to give away players to open up space. My informed speculation is that eventually Paul will agree to a deal with the Clippers. It may not be the full max, but it may be for more than what the Clippers have been offering. So it does sound like there is like some, I don't want to call it skepticism, but like they're not close on a deal right now, Paul George and the Clippers. This is kind of weird just from like both sides because do you think Paul George would want to secure money as he ages? Plain and simple. You want to make sure you're financially secure, and that's what he's trying to do, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But if you're the Clippers... You're trying to continue to build on a brand. This Clippers team, by the way, that has been pretty good when everybody's healthy. Westbrook is included in that for what it's worth. When he's healthy, they are a little better. But they're also building a new arena. They want to have a good team in there when the arena is finished so people will come and actually go to Clippers games and join the wall. You're going to have to pay to put players out there. You're still the Clippers. I know you're in a big market in L.A., but you're the little brother. You're not the Lakers if you're the Clippers. You need to pay these guys. You have to. And if you're the Clippers, I'm not convinced you're getting anybody better than Paul George. So what are you cutting corners for? You're in a very similar situation to the Celtics where it's just like you can't spend that money somewhere else. You might as well just pay it. Yeah, I don't get it. Like th- this makes all the sense from a Paul George perspective because there probably are teams out there, cough, cough, Philadelphia, who could give you like close to, if not a complete max. Um and if you're the Clippers, like, why risk losing Paul George for nothing? Just just sign him. Like, 
I get that you want to like save money and I get that you want to like, like realistically, if there was ever a time for Steve Ballmer to, I don't want to say cheap out, but like, it's probably the right after he built just a billion dollar arena. Like he's probably like, all right, let me calm down. I don't think that's what's happening, but it definitely is odd to see them be like, yeah, I don't know. And like Kawhi Leonard did just sign for less than the max. I assume James Harden's going to sign for less than the max. Uh, and the CBA coming in is a bitch. It's going to fuck them. Um, so maybe that's weighing on their minds, but this is definitely an odd situation to hear about. It would be one thing if they were like, well, this all started when they traded for James Harden this year, because had they not done that, right. Then you could at least put stock in. Okay. Like they don't think this is going to work. They're going to rebuild. They're going to get different players. They're going to try and put a different roster together. But instead, like you said, they have extended Kawhi Leonard already. You've already committed a lot of money. Even though it's not the max, it's still a lot of money to paying him. You're probably going to end up paying James Harden. Why would you not also pay Paul George? Paul George, who's been pretty decent for them this year, if I'm not mistaken. He's had stretches he's awesome. where he's been one of their best, if not the best player. Mm-hmm. He's been an all-star. He was an all-star. Which is what he's supposed to do. But <laughs> It's you know. true. He's averaged 23, 5, and 3.5 and on 47, 41 splits. It's pretty damn good. <laughs> and he plays defense. <clears throat> mm-hmm. You want that. You take that. It just It's a weird situation. I don't know. I, I feel like it'll all end up in him re-signing with the Clippers, but just to hear all the smoke around it is odd. It odd is at odd. the very least. Um, speaking of extensions, the Cavs are confident that they'll get Donovan Mitchell back um this comes from uh gilbert who's the owner i believe james gilbert right am i getting that right Um, dan gilbert dan gilbert sorry says we've been talking to him sure for the last couple years about extending his contract uh we think he will extend i think if you listen to him talk he loves the city he loves the situation in cleveland because our players are very young and we're just kind of putting the court together uh that he's clearly the biggest part of so now (laughs) yeah (laughs) are you sure Because that's not what we hear. No. We all like this is like when Kyrie was here and there were rumblings that he wasn't happy or he, he wanted to leave. And all of us were like, no, no, that can't be true. That can't be true. That can't be true. It's the same thing happening with Donovan Mitchell. Like if there's smoke, there's probably fire. Like there's a reason why we all keep hearing about Donovan Mitchell probably going somewhere else after his contract is up. I don't think he's going to stick around. Now, if you want to take the second half of this and saying he likes the situation and he likes that the roster is young and that they can continue to grow. I can see that if you're looking solely from a basketball perspective. Sure. I can, I can get behind that. Who wouldn't want to be the star of this team with Garland and Mobley and Jared Allen, who's playing at an all-star level all beside you. But to say he loves Cleveland, I don't know. I don't know how true that is. I just, I don't. Outside of people born there. Does anybody love Cleveland? John Fanta <laughs> loves it. Why? Yeah, I think he's from there. <laughs> he's just, yeah. That doesn't count. <laughs> Not a lot uh, of wrong. <laughs> no, no, I don't. I don't. I don't even get it. Like it's one of those things. Like everybody just says Cleveland is sucky, but like I've never been there, so I can't tell you. Me neither. Jakeem Noah certainly doesn't like it, and he, he must have reasons, right? Like it's I just guess. like if you could go to anywhere in the country, like if you had to go on vacation and rank the the all 30 cities in the NBA by vacation destination probably close to last right like you can even think Utah they've got mountains you can go skiing there's stuff to do right mm. like Charlotte like you can probably i don't know how close is Charlotte to the beach probably not very close um at least it's on the but, coast at the very least yeah it, it's a nice like warm weather like it's nice down there like you can find stuff to do right like like DC has all the like historic history there DC like is fine. landmark yeah DC it's cool underrated um, <clears throat> like san antonio at least they have like the alamo like there's some history there like you can find fucking something to do correct what the fuck does cleveland have <laughs> what are you doing cleveland correct it's just but like if you live there know. it's a little different but he you and i are there. also different than or nba players there, it's not from there yeah it's just, i don't know i don't know man i i i don't no, we'll see. Like happens. I don't know if an NBA player would love to live in Providence either. You know what? Maybe we're misunderstanding him, and maybe we're misunderstanding Donovan Mitchell because him saying I think he'll extend, he probably will extend. 
and then he'll I say, "Get extend. me the fuck, get me the fuck out of here now. <laughs> extend me and trade me, brother. See you later." How could we forget? These are no longer team contracts; they are NBA contracts. So if he's like, "Someone's gonna pay me money to play basketball," I will take that, and then we will deal with that later. Yes, sir. Anyways, um, la- uh, second or last NBA thing, I suppose the Knicks are unsure uh, about Julius Randle and OG Ananobi returning. Um, Josh Hart recently said uh, he said. We're going to approach the season as if those guys are gone. Uh, and if they get back, it'll be a pleasant surprise. Uh, Sham Shirani of the, of the Athletics says it seems OG Ananobi is more likely than Julius Randle at this point. It, this, this feels like the Knicks team they're going to roll into the playoffs with. And for what it's worth, this Knicks team has been playing pretty well. Like, they're still a fine team, just not even close to where they want to be with OG Ananobi and or uh, Julius Randle back in the lineup. So, Tell you what, if they end up with just OG, they might be just fine. <laughs> you yeah. don't have randall fumbling around throwing the ball off the backboard losing it out of bounds spinning into three guys might might help your team work a little bit better as a unit don't you think you don't have mm. some guy just trying to make you lose wearing your uniform i don't mm. know i think ananobi's been a good addition for them and it sounds like he's the one that's closest to coming back so they shouldn't be really worried about that i was on reddit when i saw some of this and people in the replies were like yeah like Feels like Randall has kept them from winning in the playoffs for years now. Like he was really mm-hmm. kind of decent throughout the entire regular season when they had no one in the stands, and then the playoffs came and he sucked. And he sucked in the second round last year against Miami, and they ended up losing. Eh. Doesn't move the needle for me if he comes back. OG is a little bit different because he can guard different players, but I think Randall would obviously be very good with this iteration of the team. Like, I I think he showed that. I think they were good with him. And I think this version of the team, Randall being there is very different than just Randall and Brunson alone, or just Randall alone. Um, But uh, it uh, is tough timing. Sorry, Andrew. So (laughs) your first glimmer of hope, (laughs) you're just shit down. (laughs) I'd love to see them lose in the first round. It'd be fantastic. It would be the greatest. I'd love to see it healthy. Last thing. Um, not NBA, but DJ Burns, the NC State Center, he rocks. He's sick. Did you see this clip of him just like shitting on Duke fans after their win? No, I didn't see any clips, but I'm very much aware of him and he's awesome. Their run to the Final Four. So pull it up. NC State took down Duke, uh, and during the final moments of the game, uh, DJ Burns is you know in the uh, on the block as the Duke is shooting free throws. And Duke fans are heckling him. And he just looks at them and goes, your season's over. And just starts dancing. Just, just here. (laughs) (laughs) The funny thing about him is uh, if you ever listen to him talk, he's very well-spoken. Like he, he's very wholesome. He isn't somebody looking to pick fights. He's not even, he doesn't even come off as like a trash talker is really my message here. Mm -hmm. And you got him to talk trash. Duke does it best. Did you hear Jokic? I I saw uh, that Jokic was intrigued by this gentleman. Yes. So Jokic was asked about him because DJ Burns is like a big, a skilled big guy. And someone asked him about it and he he had this to say, it might not be the best audio class, uh, audio quality, but here. He loves him. I don't think he could play in the NBA for what it's worth. (laughs) Probably not, but he like we've seen other guys get a chance like Kenny Lofton obviously hasn't worked out, but it's true. I haven't watched enough DJ Burns, um, but DJ Burns was told about this and this was his reaction to like, Jokic was like watching NC state. It's and, probably like, psyched dude. Play. And so this is, this is what he had to say when you heard about it. Really? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, we, he dunks a lot more than me, but I feel like, you know, he also shoots threes way better than me. So, um, I feel like as far as, you know, post moves and everything, we have a similar game in a sense. I wouldn't say uh, all of our game, but I say specifically as far from a post aspect. He's like, really? He's talking His about me. His face lights up. 
Very cool. As anyone just rocks. He's just awesome, man. DJ Burns is sick. He's an easy guy to root for. Like I, I mean, even listening to him speak in that clip, like you can hear like the the he has like the kid in him that's just excited about being there and loves the game and stuff. Mm-hmm. So easy to get behind him. Funny that he talks shit to the Duke fans, just because again, that doesn't really seem like his MO. Mm-hmm. Good character. Yeah. He did have a Jokic game against Marquette. He had so on the run to the tournament, um, he had 16 on uh, 11 shots against Texas Tech, 24 and 11 on 12 shots against Oakland, and then in the most recent game, uh, 19 shots, 29 points. But against Marquette, he only took four shots, but had seven assists. So he was like, "Yeah, fuck it. We should be a passer. We should set my set the guys up." Uh, I just like DJ Burns. He's just he's just cool. So that's it. Uh, all right, Rattless time, Sam. Would you like to kick it off? You go ahead. All right, <clears throat> first one. So. Whenever I tell stories about my dogs, it's boring because I don't leave the house, but I actually have one today. So I, I woke up uh, I this morning. I saw this. I went to make myself some breakfast. And so I was making eggs and I let one dog outside. And this is just this is just like a, a culmination of fuckery. Um, mm. <clears throat> let one dog outside. She immediately goes over to the fence and starts bar- barking at the neighbor's dog. So I'm mad. I'm like, what the fuck? Get in here. And as I'm outside, my other dog starts barking out the front window on the other side of the house because somebody else is outside. So then I have to run over there shut him up and then i'm making my food and i i making like an egg and cheese sandwich so i have the cheese out and they like it so i go to throw duke who you all know a piece of cheese hits him in the face doesn't catch it moron he's just not fucking paying attention I'm like dude you're that's like your one thing like is you like food just catch it <clears throat> other dog comes in i go to throw her a piece hits her in the face doesn't catch it duke eats it for out from under i'm like are you stupid? And she's like, starts scurrying away. I'm like, do you want it? She comes back. I throw another one at her lands on her back, like right on her neck, like above her face. She runs away from me with the cheese stuck on her fucking head. Like an idiot. Like she's just scurrying out. Best part. It was like a small piece. of cheese. It was like a full piece. But it was like, it was like a quarter of it. I don't know where it went. I can't find the cheese. It's just gone. And she came into my room. So there's definitely just like fucking cheese laying around somewhere, but it's gone. She just ran away with it on her fucking head. And I have no idea where it went. And so there's just cheese somewhere in my house now because she's an asshole. And it's just like, ugh. I wonder how long it'll take you guys to find the cheese. It's a very small piece of cheese, but it just, what the fuck? <laughs> what are we doing? Hmm. I'm going to say, uh, Man, I don't really have anything. Ratless, my creativity. I mean, I, I can't come up with anything. I, I got nothing for you. I'm Damn. so mad at myself that I have no creative juices in me, like, whatsoever. I go through stretches of, like, trying to write for Celtics blog, and I just, like, keep myself from writing. And I'm like, ah, no, I don't have a good idea. It's okay. I won't do it. I, I could not be more disappointed in myself. I, I will continue to sit here and stew and think about what I would like to discuss, but I, I currently have nothing. So ratless creativity. <laughs> All right. Um, I only really have two today, so I'll go again. If you don't have anything by the end of this, then we're just going to have a really short ratless. But I was driving home <clears throat> from dropping my sister off at the train, um, and I got uh, – moseying along driving down the road i got to this half intersection i'm gonna try to pull it up on um google to like explain all right i'll move the rat my uh my context here um but here jeez i was uh driving along i get to this intersection driving up drive past it and this car comes along the other way so it's like a windy road and there's an, I, I really can't find it. I'm really getting like annoyed that I can't find it. But um, <clears throat> I'm going to have to like drive down from my street to like figure out where I was because <laughs> there's just no landmark because it's just like a back road. Like there's no actual landmark to like distinguish where this uh, thing is. Um, here we go. It's right here. So I'll share screen uh, audio listeners. Just <clears throat> listen to my description. So I was driving along this road. Uh, let me put a little dude down. I was coming back the other way. So there's this like little bridge. It's actually a nice road. It's like a little bridge pathway thing across a pond. It's nice. Look at that. You um, get the little water on the side. <clears throat> right. It's a big, big lake. It's pretty. Uh, but I was driving this way. Drive right now. Mm-hmm. I was driving this way. So I'm coming from this side. And I'm coming this way. Right <clears throat> now. Mm-hmm. You're looking this way. Right. As you can see on the uh, on the YouTube, I am going straight through here. 
I do not have a stop sign. Correct, Sam? Yep. Fouch? No stop sign. Technically, this street also doesn't have a stop sign. However, they need to stop because I clearly have the right of way. Correct? Yes? Yes. So I see chugging along this way. See the car. Top of the car? Student driver. <laughs> N- never something you want to see. No. Never. Student driver comes down here. And I can only imagine in their brain, they're like, oh, I don't have a stop sign. I'm good. Mm. And so I'm about here on the on the screen. You can see I'm like in the middle of the other, like I'm just passing the road. And the car's about like five feet from me. I'm like, oh, <laughs> so we're just not stopping. And I it got to the point where I was self-conscious. I'm like, did I have a stop sign? <laughs> like, did I miss something here? What are we doing? And then the car wasn't behind me long. And like, as you can see, rolling up here like the stop sign to get to the next street is like maybe what 500 feet in front like it's right up here um by the time i got to the stop sign i couldn't even see the car behind me so the instructor definitely made them pull over and like think about what they had done because like they were not even close to me so i had like a moment of panic because i thought i was in there like, it, w- it was so outlandish that i thought i fucked up i'm like did i <laughs> stop sign? like what? are we just like that is pretty bad cool, but like they completely just did not like they acted like they had the right away. And I was like, I, I don't think you're correct here, brother. I, I don't know what's going on. This is, this is not great. I actually had somebody almost run me off the road yesterday. So I was merging wow. on the highway and you, you know how it goes when you merge on, there's the little disappearing lane and yeah. I'm like almost to the end of it. I, I don't really have anywhere to go. And this person is doing the old, I'm not going slow enough for you to get in front, but I'm not going fast enough for you to filter in behind me. So I, just ended up having a beep and he almost got into an accident. He swerved. But I mean, you got to have some awareness. You have a responsibility yeah. as a driver to know what's going on. You know, you're driving next to an entryway. You have to pay attention at least a little bit. You have to either speed up or slow down. When you're driving past the entryway, you either speed, you, you gauge, right? And I had this happen right. to me. I think I told the story on here. You either speed up so they have enough space to go behind you or slow down so they have enough space to go in front of you. And I was doing this once and uh, I was, there was like a a big enough gap in front of me for them to go, but there was an even bigger gap behind me. So I'm like, all right, let me speed up really fast. I'll let them go behind me. There's a big gap there. That's easy. They speed up in turn with me and then drive along me in the breakdown lane. There's like, they're past the point of the fucking like little disappearing lane there. And so they're just next to me. They're yelling at me. I go, what the fuck do you want? Go like, (laughs) go. And so they drive a little bit forward and I like, and just mad so i flip them off they stop fully in front of me like they get in front of me but they saw that mm. i flipped them off so they stop and i just kept driving and i just like waved to them as i walk as i drove by i'm like dude i left so much space for you behind me that was the whole point are you stupid like what yeah. are you doing my exit's up here i had to like i'm going like hello <laughs> so the juices have just... began to flow for me uh-huh. a little bit so uh i'll send you this in the private chat but this is this is a general rat this is nothing happened to me Rat list anybody that's watching basketball games, or I guess any sport for that matter, that are just like fans of players instead of fans of teams. The, the, the player people are the absolute worst. Now, I know we have some listeners of the show that are like this, but they have valid reasoning. I'm, I'm looking at you, Pete, the GOAT. Pete has uh, come along to the Celtics fandom because he is following his Latvian co-citizen Kristaps, right? <laughs> so I'm on Twitter today and I see this. I This is what I see. I can't believe some of the people that, that you got nothing going on. <laughs> Look at him. He's the LeBron people are the absolute worst. I despise the LeBron people. Nobody, no fan acts like this. This is, this is criminal. This is an insane level of fame. following players <laughs> over teams should just not be allowed. It's almost as bad as the betting. <laughs> it, it's it, it's god awful. It is it is kind of crazy. What, do you like all the the muse accounts? LeBron muse, Tatum muse. I hate the muse accounts. You know, there's a Tillman muse. Some of it's like kind of funny. If you're gonna be like a niche <laughs> muse, it's a little funny. Or if you're a team muse, it's okay. Because I think the team muse ones are like. At least trying to like give you updates on your team. Yeah, but if you're just following a player, it's it's criminal. Name a player. Name a random NBA player. I'm gonna see if they have a muse. Davis Bertans. Davis Bertans muse. 
I hope this is not telling for whatever we watched in Monday's game. There is a Davis Bear Towns Muse. There sure is. <laughs> um, Get the- Ratlist. <laughs> Ratlist, the guy I played in MLB show, MLB the show today. There it is. Mm-hmm. Oh, he's rebranding as wait. No, this is a different one. This is a different music account. Um <laughs> yeah, but Latvian and Laser Bear Towns does have a muse. <laughs> Anyways, sorry, go ahead. Ratless, the guy I played in MLB The Show today. So I remain undefeated in MLB The Show. I still have not lost. I'm up to 14 and 0. Won a pair of games this afternoon. However, the last game I played was very, I thought I might lose. I ended up winning 10 to 7. And it's funny, I was actually going to message the person after the game and be like, good game. You played well. You were hard to pitch to. He sends me a message before I even have the chance. And he calls me a low ball merchant. <laughs> if you're going to call me a low ball merchant, now what he means is I'm throwing pitches below the zone in the dirt, which is kind of how I pitch. Why, why did he swing at them? <laughs> that is, that is, that is the question. That is the question because you want to know what I did is I took my walks in that game. I walked three or four times. I just won't swing. If I, if I'm not getting the pitch, I want to swing. it. I won't swing at it. Yeah, that's how simple. baseball works. Yeah. That's how you play. <laughs> That's how baseball is. If you want me to pitch different, then quit letting me pitch like that. Yeah. Plain and simple. Dickhead. Then called me lucky. I had two perfect, perfect lineouts because your dumbass stadium was at an altitude. So the ball just glides instead of actually, you know, using gravity to go to the ground. Mm-hmm. It was unbelievable. But anyways, there's that. And I'm going to do it, Jack. I wasn't sure I was going to do it. I'm going to do it. Ratless white people church. So... <laughs> If you have grown up, I, I I don't know if your family's religious, Jack. Are uh, they? We were we were when we were younger, but not really. Like not. That's how really. it went for me. My mom would would have liked uh, to go to church on Easter. Would like to go on Christmas. Had me go mm-hmm. through all the classes and everything. Yep. Church church is not fun. When you're a kid, church is not fun. Usually, you're going on a holiday, which makes it worse. You want to go home and play with your new toys, whether it's from the mm-hmm. Easter Bunny or Santa. So as we approached Easter Easter yesterday, a couple weeks ago, I'm hanging out with the lady and she's very quiet. She's anxious about something. I'm like, what the hell's bothering you? She says to me, are there basketball games on Easter? And I said, I think so. But I thought the Celtics would play on Easter, but they didn't. But even if they did, she was like, oh, I was going to see if you want to go to church. I was like, there's no games in the morning. So fast forward. Yeah. Yesterday was Easter. We do go to church. Now, for those of you that are not ancient listeners of this show, back in the bubble of 2020 was the last time I went to church for a non-funeral. I went to church the morning of game six of the 2020 bubble playoffs against the Heat to try and give our boys the backing that they needed to get over the hump. They were trying to come down, come back from down 3-1 they did not win the game. They didn't win the game. My heart was broken. Some of you were in the comments saying serves you right. Fair enough. This is the first time I've gone back since then. And she's aware of this. So I was joking with her as we walk in. You know, this is a big, big spot. Big spot. Big couple months for the man upstairs. Big playoffs incoming. A lot riding on this appearance from me today. She didn't love it. But anyways, we go in. This does not look like my church that I grew up going to. They have a big screen at the front on a stage. This is the most incredible experience I have ever had in a church. They had a countdown before the mass started. It started at five minutes. They were ticking down the seconds. It's like when you're at the garden before the game, they got the the timer and then they play the Mm -hmm. hype video. They had like little ads on the screen for upcoming events like you're at the movies. So then they start at the church and it's like a concert. It was the incredible energy. Of course, like no wonder she likes church. It's so much more fun than what what I grew up with. (laughs) And then we're in there and the pastor finally goes up to like give his sermon. And they were talking about hope. And what did he use as an example for his sermon? Well, would you believe he starts talking about the Celtics? Giving the Atlanta Hawks hope. I could not believe it. I was like, 
I I was like starting to believe a little bit. Like I'm not super religious, but I was thinking, is this a sign? Are they trying to speak to me? Are they trying to get? Is this meant to be? And she is going berserk next to me, laughing, like nudging me. So I had a blast. I don't know why everybody doesn't do church like this. So she's Christian and I grew up Catholic. Yeah. Why? What are we doing wrong, people? If Will you, you be going did back? church like this, they also did a separate service for the kids downstairs, I guess. Mm-hmm. If you did church like that, you know how easy it would be to get people to buy in? And you're not bored? That was a blast. I think it went way longer than like Catholic mass goes too. How long was it? How long were you there? Maybe an hour 15, hour and a half compared that's to like 45 a... minutes. Yeah, this is a little longer. You going back though? You had a good time? <laughs> you reattending? I'm not going back next week, but, but I will it, go back again. You were asked again. Yeah, yeah. I would I go back again. It would not be a problem at all. I had a good time. Mm-hmm. So yes, rat list to those not doing it right. Agree. I'm with you. That's all I got. You got anything else? No, that's it. Wrap it up there. Thank you all for tuning in. We appreciate it very much. Make sure to subscribe to How About Them Celtics. Leave a like on the video as well. If you're listening on audio platforms, follow us there. Leave a review. We'd appreciate it very much. Uh, live to, or tonight as you're listening to this, uh, right? Tonight we'll be live, the 6 p.m. Table. on the channel with Celtics of the Roundtable with a whole horde of people. will be us, Bobby Karitsky uh, from SI Media Group and Talking Seas, Cam Tabatabai of Celtics Lab and Celtics Wire, Noah Dalzell of Celtics Blog, Kari Thompson of Boston.com, and Justin Turpin of WEI. Got it all out in one breath. Appreciate y'all for tuning in. Be there 6 p.m. tonight, and we'll see y'all later. Sam, wrap it up. Hey, thank you very much for listening or watching. Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hit the notification bell so you don't miss any of our daily uploads. We're coming at you with something new every day at 5 a.m., whether it's these pods on Tuesday, Thursday, and Sunday, game recaps the morning after, or we are live for Talk and Seas Monday, Wednesday, and Friday in the morning around 11 a.m. Eastern. You can also find, like Jack said, Celts at the Round Table on Tuesdays around 6. Tonight, it will be 6 p.m. start. So be there and also be there for pregames. Pregames are a blast. Half hour before each game, we'll be here no matter what. You can find us on Spotify and Apple as well. Our pods and game recaps are there for those audio listeners. Leave a five-star review. We would appreciate it. You can reach out to us via email, hbtcpod at gmail.com. It's a great way to get in contact with us. You saw RJ do it thrice today. Get in on the fun. Send us your thoughts on the Celtics. Send us your rat list. We love to hear from you guys, and you're a big part of what we do. So get involved. You can find us on socials at How About Them Seas, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. The Facebook is just the name of the podcast. Our streams are there. They're on YouTube, and they are on Twitter. Jack's Twitter is at Jack Simone NBA. Mine is at Sam LaFrance NBA. That's it for us. Bye. Check, check, go.